نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلوات والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا اله الا الله والله اكبر ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم الصلاه والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله الصلاه والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم All praise is for Allah, the Almighty, All-Powerful, Creator of the heavens of the, and the earth, Controller, Nourisher, Cherisher, Sustainer, Planner. He created everything. He will destroy everything. He will resurrect everything. And uh, men and jinn will be held accountable for all their deeds. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. and grant us the life that can bring success and peace in this world and in the hereafter and in in today's halaqa i will try to finish off with excellent conduct by going over a list of do's and don'ts in the quran with respect to ex- excellent conduct meaning Uh, meeting responsibilities towards fellow human beings and then uh, talk about some of the beautiful husnul uh, khuluq of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so let's start it's a list of 75 do's and don'ts with respect to uh fellow human beings nothing with respect to allah don't lie don't spy don't exalt meaning don't be too joyous don't insult don't waste feed the poor don't backbite keep your oaths don't take bribes honor your treaties restrain your anger and we have looked at verses from the quran with respect to this this ju- these are just references to one verse and the whole verse it is not the, that the verse is in this manner it's part of the verse or 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 gist of the verse don't spread gossip think good of others be good to guests don't harm believers don't be rude to parents turn away from ill speech don't make fun of others walk in a humble manner respond to evil with good don't say what you don't do keep your trusts and promises don't insult others false gods don't deceive people in trade don't take items without right don't ask unnecessary questions don't be miserly nor extravagant don't call others with bad names don't claim yourselves to be pure speak nicely even to the ignorant don't ask for repayment for favors make room for others at gatherings if enemy wants peace then accept it return a greeting in a better manner don't remind others of your favors make peace between fighting groups lower your voice and talk modestly don't let hatred cause you to be unjust don't ask too many favors from people greet people when entering their home be just even against yourself and relatives speak gently even to 
leaders of disbelief don't criticize small contributions of others. Don't call the prophet how to how you call others. Don't call the prophet how you call others. Try to make peace between husband and wife. Don't call the prophet from outside his rooms. Oppression, corruption is worse than killing. Reach to others in a good and wise manner. Don't accuse others of immorality without proof. Consider wives of the prophet like your mothers. Don't raise your voice above that of the prophets. Don't call someone a disbeliever without knowing. Seek permission before entering someone's room. Know your enemies can become your close friends to good behavior. Don't wrongly consume the wealth of the vulnerable. Don't turn your cheek away from people in arrogance. Forgive others as you would like Allah to forgive you. Seek prophet's permission when leaving his gathering. Don't hold secret meetings for sin, rather do so for piety. Don't order others to do good while forgetting it yourself. Be patient with your teacher and follow his instructions. And this is, uh, by the way, in reference to Musa salam going to meet Al-Khidr when Musa uh, mistakenly said he's the most knowledgeable person. And Allah Ta'ala orders him to go and meet Al-Khidr. So, so uh, Allah is saying, uh, sorry, uh, between conversation between Musa salam and Khidr, Al-Khidr, this comes out. Be patient with your teacher and follow his instructions. Don't frown, turn away or neglect those who come to you. Be, if unable to help a needy person, at least speak nice words to him. Be lenient to those under you and consult them in matters of state. Allah Ta'ala is telling Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, consult them in matters of state. And through that, he's teaching uh, us and our leaders. Mashwara. Paramorsha. Verify information from a dubious source before acting upon it. Don't remain in the Prophet's home unnecessarily after a meal. Those who can should continue to spend on those less fortunate. And there are many verses on spending. Don't enter homes without permission and return if refused entry. Don't sit with those who mock religion until they change the subject. Say, it's not appropriate to talk of slander when it's mentioned to you. If required to ask the prophet's wives, then do so from behind the screen. If people have question of the prophet's wives. And this is after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, passed away. Divorce in an amicable manner instead of keeping and harming your wife. Punish in an equivalent manner to how you would, uh, how you were harmed, or be patient. Punish in an equi equivalent manner to how you were harmed, or be patient. Differences in color and language are signs of Allah, not means of superiority, not means of discrimination. Don't take woman by force, nor take back bridal gift without a valid reason and live with them in kindness. So 75 verses, there should be more verses on excellent, superior, beautiful conduct and character. And these are uh, gist of the verses, not the complete verses. And uh, when you go through these, when you go over these, there's at least one person who would come to our mind. And that is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Aisha radiallahu anha was asked by someone after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, tell us, and, and by the way, I'm saying this from my memory, so it would be a near rendition of the tradition. Tell us something about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she said, haven't you read the Quran? 
he was like a moving Quran. Whatever we went through, no, it, 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 I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure it would seem that that we are hearing about Rasulullah Sallallahu He followed every bit of it, and he followed every bit of what he said. All the 230 or so traditions that we went over, he acted on those, first and foremost. If we read his, his sirah, his way of life, and then he, there are so many books written on him as on nobody else in the world. You will find that whatever we hear in terms of what he said constitutes excellent, beautiful character. He acted on those first and foremost. So after 23 years of continuous struggle, Rasulullah instilled in his Sahaba unflinching faith in the oneness of Allah and in his Nabuwa. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Many of his sallam, many of his followers were his arch enemies, but through sheer beauty of his beautiful character and conduct, he won them over to his mission. And, and this is what I mentioned earlier. One, one of the goals of this beautiful uh, character, Husnul Khuluq or Husni Akhlaq, is that we, through these, attract others towards Islam. And that is what he did. His arch enemies became his staunch friends. From the worship, so he, he won them over to his mission. And what was his mission? From the worship of man and idols to the worship of the one Allah with all his manifold attributes. From the narrowness of this mortal world to the vastness of the eternal life. From servitude to of self, worship of self and shaitan and, wor and the world, worldly attractions to eternal emancipation. The Sallallahu brought a complete way of life that lays down obligations to the creator and obligations to fellow human beings. We will be held accountable in terms of these obligations. Imaniyat will enable us to meet obligations to the creator and the reckoner. And Imaniyat is belief in the unseen. And uh, I think yesterday the thought came to my mind that we say it is belief in the unseen, but there is one person who saw Allah and the angels. And we see books, all of us see the book that is revealed to us, Quran. And the other books are uh, uh, revised thoroughly. We don't see the other books in the original form, but we see at least one book. And uh, we haven't seen the prophet, by the way, but Rasulullah saw the unseen. Everything of the unseen was shown to him. And that one person never lied in his life. Imaniyat enables us to meet obligations towards the Almighty, the Creator, and the Reckoner. He will take Hisab. And Imaniyat, in conjunction with Husne Akhlaq, will enable us to meet obligations to fellow human beings. In the first column is the Articles of Faith, Imaniyat. The second column is, is uh, Ibadat, Worship of Allah. <clears throat> so Imaniyat helps us in firm Iman in Allah and the artic other articles of faith will enable us to meet obligations towards Allah. And, and one of the obligations is actually zakat, but that is a obligation to fellow human beings. And uh, Imaniyat, in conjunction with Akhlaqiyat, the third column, in conjunction with Akhlaqiyat, will enable us to meet obligations towards fellow human beings. beings. So Imaniyat enables us to meet obligations towards Allah. 
and Imaniyat in conjunction with Imaniyat and Akhlaqiyat will enable us to meet obligations towards, towards fellow human beings, will enable us to, uh, in our muamilat, in our dealings with uh, various groups of people, in our transactions, in buying and selling, and will help us to uh, establish muasharat, a social system, Islamic social system. So we need both imaniyat as well as akhlaqiyat. Okay, now Husna Khuluk, in terms of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the Quran, there are so many verses extolling the noble qualities of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I came across at least 30 verses. And as examples, I will quote two of them, actually parts of two of them, uh, in Surah al ahzab Verse number 21, Allah Ta'ala says, Lakat kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana. The near meaning of which is, there has certainly been for you in the messenger of Allah an excellent pattern, is the part of the verse. An excellent example for us is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And actually the only example for us that we need to lead our life. And uh, in surah number 68, verse number four, uh, Allah Ta'ala says, And the near meaning is, and you are surely an excellent standard of character. In a hadith at Kulsi, narrated by Ata Raziallahu Anhu, which is uh, mentioned in Bukhari Sharif, uh, the qualities of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are mentioned in that, in the, in that hadith. Allah Ta'ala says, O Prophet, we have surely sent you as a witness, a bringer of good tidings for the obedient, a warner for those who are astray, and a protector of the ummis, the ignorant. You are my chosen servant and apostle. I have named you the trusting Alameen, since you are, you trust me in every matter. You are neither rough mannered nor hard hearted, nor do you uproar in the marketplace. You never requite evil for evil. You never give back evil because of evil, but forgive and overlook. Allah will not give you death till he has brought you your stray nation on the right path through you. And that means uh, Allah will make them true Muslims through the kalima. And the last part that is mentioned in that hadith is, and has given light to the blind eyes. That means Allah will not give you death until he has given light to the blind eyes of the unbelievers and has opened their deaf ears and closed their hearts. In some other traditions, following additional merits of Rasulullah have been mentioned. I will refine you with all that is noble I, and endow you with every noble habit and will make, you, make tranquility your attire, your dress and trait quality and piety your conscience, and wisdom the substance of your thought and knowledge, and truthfulness and sincerity your nature, and forgiveness and good works your custom, and justice your practice, truth your rule, righteousness your guide, and forge the followers of Islam into a community. Your name is Ahmed, the praised one, through you, I will show the people right path after their deviation from it and bestow knowledge and wisdom upon them after their complete ignorance. 
through you, I will raise my creators from the abysmal, that means from the depths to the heights of perfection. Through you, I will bestow loftiness on my creatures after they have been ignorant and unconscious of the truth. Through you as their guide, I will enlarge the number of your followers, which is now small. Through you, I will change their poverty and destitution into abundance. And this is a part into abundance. I had to impute into it because it did not come out in the print. Through you, I will create accord and harmony between antagonists and antagonists, enemies, confused minds and disunited nations. And finally, will make your ummah the best ummah for the guidance of mankind. <clears throat> now the extent to which we will imbibe from these halakas will depend on our paying attention to what we hear. And we can pay attention only when we understand the importance of seeking knowledge, the importance of knowing Allah and his Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that our success lies in knowing Allah and obeying Allah in the way shown by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our success and peace in this world and in the eternal life. So when we have that importance about knowledge, then we will pay importance to listening to what is said in terms of knowledge. Because nobody can force us to listen. Nobody can force us to attend these. Once we have come, why not we ensure that we are listening with attention, with respect to the words of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with the intention to practice and with the intention to, with the intention to convey so that Allah Ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to practice what we hear. These are not for the sake of seeking knowledge, but for the sake of seeking knowledge to practice. Islam is not in knowing, but in practicing. Now I thought about, I was thinking about today's halakha. What should I say? Uh, we, have, uh, we have covered uh, over 230 traditions on Husni Akhlaq. Husnul Khuluq, beautiful uh, conduct and character. So how should I conclude? So I thought to myself that why not I pick some of the beautiful uh, character of Rasulullah and speak a few words on each one of them. Some of, few of them, maybe five, maybe six. So I listed five of them. Number one, steadfastness. He was steadfast in spite of difficulties throughout his life. Number two, he was kind in spite of persecution over his entire Nabuat. Number three, he was austere in spite of abundance the Almighty wanted to bestow on him. Number four, he was humble in spite of the highest position in dunya and akhira the Almighty granted to him. Number five, he was devout to Allah Ta'ala in all circumstances. Rather than, you know, I listed before you in a previous halakha about 30 uh, husnul khuluq of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Actually in a sitting, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, as I heard from a scholar, a learned scholar, he mentioned that uh, there are 360 qualities that constitute husnul khuluq, 360. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, humble as he was, he's, he asked, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do I possess any of the 360 qualities? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you possess all of them. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam must possess more than 360. And I presented before you something like 30, uh, beautiful, of his beautiful characteristics, qualities, attributes. From there, I listed down to five. I brought down to five. And actually under steadfastness, I listed fortitude, forbearance, perseverance, patience, all of which has have to do with uh, steadfastness. He had a most turbulent life and he was steadfast in spite of that. 
a range of difficulties and trials, and he was steadfast in spite of that. He was an orphan reared by foster mother until age five, Bibi Halima. His mother died when he was six. So between five and six, he was with his mother. Actually, when he was two years old, he was brought back, or three years old, he was brought back by uh, Halima, uh, Hazrat Halima, anha, and uh, took, took him again from the mother because of the blessings she was receiving for, for rearing up uh, the, the baby. So uh, basically until age five, he was with uh, his foster mother. And then he was brought back and mother died uh, within about a year or so. Grandfather died when he was eight. Two uncles died. One was Abu Talib and the other was Hamza uh, Razi Allah Anhu in the Battle of Uhud. Two wives died, Hazrat Khadija Razi Allah Anha and uh, uh, one of the two Zainab Razi Allah Anha. Um, three sons and three daughters died as per one source. And a granddaughter died. So that is a total of 13 close relatives who died during his lifetime that I could, I could uh, come across, 13, there could be more. Close relatives, so many companions were killed or tortured and so on and so forth. Untold hardship suffered through his entire 23 years of Nabuat, withstood all hardship unwaveringly. Anas Razi Allah Anhu from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have been hurt in the cause of Allah as none has been and I have been scared out of my wits as none has been. And uh, about, about such persons, Allah Ta'ala says, those who are steadfast in patience. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there is no gift that is better and more comprehensive than patience. Forbearance. There's a story on forbearance, but I will bypass that because I, I don't think time, time will allow me his forbearance. I, I gave one example earlier and a Bedouin came to him and uh, held his mantle that was around uh, wrapped around his neck, held his mantle and tugged it so hard that he was about to suffocate and said, give me something that Allah has given you. This is not your property or, or your father's property. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled back at him in spite of such behavior. Oh, Muhammad, he addressed him like that. And uh, I, I will cut it short by saying that he asked uh, uh, Anas Razi Allah who give him something from the treasury, fill his camel with, uh, with food. So that was the first one, steadfastness. Um, he was most steadfast, whether in peace, so-called peace, there was no peace for him basically or in war. Number two, kindness, from which earlier I said that I think his most important quality was kindness uh, because that is the most important quality for us uh, in terms of Allah. And that's why he repeats it again and again, uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, so for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi I would say his most important quality was kindness. But then, you know, yesterday or day before yesterday, it occurred to me that his steadfastness was the most pivotal characteristics of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi And then as I thought further yesterday, it seemed to me that every one of the five that I've listed could be among the top. So when somebody is kind, the person is caring and considerate and compassionate and generous and magnanimous and forgiving. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi had all of these qualities. And he can tell one or more stories on each one of these. And uh, we mentioned in one, actually in two halakas about this aspect of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's noble qualities, nine stories in two halakas. And I mentioned this as being the most important attribute to me Two days ago, it seemed to me his steadfastness stands, stands out over other attributes. You can tell a story or two on each one of these attributes. So I'll bypass kindness and the other uh, uh, offshoot of kindness. Austerity. Abu Umama Razi Allah narrates, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, 
my Lord told me he could transform the valley of Makkah into a valley of gold if I so desired. But I said, no, my Lord, I prefer to remain without meals for one day and shed tears and remember thee and eat to my fill the next day and offer thanks and praise thee. I have rephrased in my way to make it short. So go without food and adopt sabr and eat and express uh, appreciation. I don't want valley of, valley of gold. And he was offered uh, kingship and nabuwa or kingship and fakr, fakr. That means uh, uh, poverty. And he chose king, uh, and, and, sorry, nabuwa and, and fakr. Uh, he chose nabuwa and, uh, and poverty. I crossed some of them because uh, some of the lines or some of the portions, because last night it seemed to me that it would be very difficult to cover. Of, and, and he mentioned, of all the favors of Allah, I like this, referring to hunger, the most, of all the favors of Allah. And he considers hunger as favor. And by the way, all the difficulties that he went through in life and the uh, persecution and the death and his own suffering for uh, 13 days before he died, his own suffering, they're all uh, thrust by Allah as favor upon him because his, his position will be raised on the day of judgment, his status, as will be the case of all those who go through suffering in this life uh, in Imam. So his position will also be raised. But this hunger, poverty that he suffered was through his own choosing, as I would say, as inspired by Allah. And he also mentioned that hisab will be easy for the person who suffers hunger and poverty. Aisha anha said he never ate to his fill. He loved poverty more than riches and hunger more than satiation. I crossed out some parts, as I said. Aisha anha also mentioned, be there no ease and luxury. He, she once expressed this. Be there no ease and luxury for us, but would that we had enough for a simple living. And Rasulullah said, Oh Aisha, what have we to do with the world? Many of my brothers, meaning prophets of high determination, suffered many hardships, remained patient, and were granted high position and diverse comforts. I do not like ease in this world at the cost of infinite bounties in the hereafter. You get ease in the world, but you lose infinite bounties in the hereafter. I do not like that. I like to meet my brothers in this condition that I am in. He left the mortal world within a month of saying this to, uh, to Aisha Rizyallahu Anha. So uh, that was one motivation for him for craving hunger and deprivation. We crave for food, but he craved for hunger and deprivation. So that was one motivation. He wanted to compete with his, with his brothers. He wanted to get the highest position in the hereafter. The other was to teach us to shun the luxuries of this world. Yeah. Most people in the world are steeped in luxury. At, at least those who have money, they just cannot avoid it. So money is a big test in which the ummah fails or, or human beings fail. They overlook all the sufferings around them and, and uh, bestow the luxury on themselves, the money on themselves, the wealth on themselves, the power on themselves in, in, in satiating their desires. Use it rather, so the object, ob, object of wealth is to use it or, or the dunya, the object of dunya is to use it rather than being used by it. The ob, object of dunya is to meet our needs rather than our wants because there is no end to wants. There is end to needs. Needs are limited, but wants are unlimited. If we pursue wants, we will never be done with fulfilling our wants. The ob objective is that we do not be slave of the world and of our nafs and of shaitan. Umar ibn Auf, radiallahu anhu, reported Rasulullah said, by Allah, 
It is not poverty I fear for you, rather I fear for you. I fear you will be given the wealth of the world just as it was given to those before you. You will compete for it just as they competed for it and it will ruin you just as it ruined them. Muslim declines started with affluence. Rasulullah gave away whatever wealth that came to him. Teach us, keep a distance from wealth and affluence and power and fame. These are transient. Umar who once cried, once cried when he saw a lot of wealth pouring into Muslim nations when he was Khalifa because of victories. He cried. Somebody asked him, why are you crying? And he said, I can see the decline of my nation. Rasulullah did not take bread to his field for three days consecutively passed away but was not able to eat to his fill even with dates and water. Most of the time they, meaning his family, did not take anything more than barley in their dinner. Never saw bread of sifted flour of wheat his entire life. Aisha Rizyallahu said by Allah, fire was not kindled in the houses of Rasulullah Sallallahu for two to three months and we saw the first full moon and the second full moon and the third full moon and fire was not kindled and uh, she was narrating to her to her uh, nephew and the nephew asked oh uh, aunt how did you pass your days and she said with two black things dates and water and sometimes with milk that was gifted by the Ansar who had sheep or goat or camels. This, this last part was enough to express the poverty that he endured for himself. He didn't tell us to endure such poverty. Allah, Allah Ta'ala said, eat of the good things that I have that I have uh, sent for you, bestowed on you. But he also said, do not waste. And, and you know, you can spend uh, one or two or few talims on uh, only this aspect of Rasulullah's life. Umar asked Hafsa anha once, what was the best dress of Rasulullah And she said, a pair of brownish dress that he wore during for Juma and for receiving uh, ambassadors like uh, Ambassador uh, Jahangir. Best food. What was the best food that you ate in your house? And she said, simple barley bread, not always. And what was the best bedding that you had for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Canvas sheet, canvas sheet. Fold it twofold or sometimes fourfold. He didn't like fourfold. The next quality that came to my mind is, well, is his humility. And, you know, two entities are beyond human expression, compre comprehension, and appreciation. We just cannot comprehend the attributes of these two entities. Allah and his Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in their entirety, we just cannot. He was the most exalted of prophets, Alaihi Wasallam, and he was the humblest. Detested Sahaba standing up in respect. He did not allow them to, uh, to stand up in respect when he entered a, a, a place where they were seated, whether it was masjid or a house. He did not sit within a group in a conspicuous place so that when a person entered where he was seated, if the person did not know who was the prophet, 
the person could not have identified who was the prophet because he was not occupying a conspicuous place. And when he entered a gathering, when he entered the masjid and there was a gathering, he وسلم, did not occupy a conspicuous place. He would sit at the back. Even a slave woman of Medina could approach and talk to him and could invite him. And he would not say no. He would not withdraw his hands from a handshake as long as the other person did not withdraw his hands. Such humility would not like to walk ahead in a group setting. Never shouted in anger. There's no record of his shouting in anger. He would express his anger. People could understand when he was angry. But he would not give vent to his anger. The next one, devoutness. As Aisha anha reports, Rasulullah remembered Allah every moment and all the time and was ever busy in meditation. Nothing could hold him back from the contemplation of Allah. Everything he said would be in remembrance of Allah, mentioning about paradise and hell to encourage the desire to do good and excite fear of the consequence of evil works. All this was in remembrance of Allah. He was, a, he was the teacher. So he was uh, uh, turning their attention towards Allah and the Akhirah and building their Iman in Allah and Hisab and the Akhirah. His every breath, every moment of his heart and tongue, he's sitting down and getting up, he's standing and he's lying down, he's moving about, his walking, his riding, his traveling, and his stay, his eating, drinking, and smelling. No act, aspect, or circumstance of his life, but had the contemplation of Allah inherent in it, whatever its mode might be. His day and night prayers and devotions. From the time Rasulullah woke up for tahajjud to the time of going to bed, and he would go to bed early after Isha and dinner. At all times and moments, in all conditions and circumstances, in every practice and behavior, Rasulullah used to recite prayers. And that is one huge gift he left for us. Prayers under different circumstances and specific prayers for specific purposes. Some of these are to solve some worldly problems and some for moral and spiritual guidance and elevation in dunya and akhirah and some for protection from shaitan. And so that he taught us to get all our problems solved from Allah through these prayers and through obeying Allah Ta'ala and following uh, in the way shown by Rasulullah Sallallahu And that is the essence of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Allah has control over everything. He gives problems. He solves problems. Creation cannot do anything without the will of Allah. Allah can do anything without creation. Creation doesn't have any power except that what is granted by creation. Allah has all the powers. And he grants power to creation, some abilities to creation, and he can take away the power at any time he wants to. That's the essence of the kalima. People would approach him about various maladies, about various problems. Uh, for example, this is just an example. I am much given to falsehood, Ya Rasulullah. A, I'm a hypocrite and I sleep too much. And Rasulullah would pray something like this, Oh Allah, make him truthful by thy grace, grant him perfectness of faith, cure his excessive sleepiness. And so many others, uh, other types of problems that were brought before him. I'm unable to control my tongue. He prayed. He prayed for a number of people for various purposes. Uh, it, it, this comes in this part of the tradition from where I got it. And, and, and that was just about a couple of days before he passed away. Conclusion, among the endless area of creation of the creator, if you, if you, uh, could stack all the endless array of creation of the creator. And there are so many luminous objects that he created. The brightest entity is 
Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He would outshine everything that Allah Taala has created. Everything else would pale in comparison. We are infinitely fortunate to be among His own Ummah. Muslims do not understand the blessing of the Almighty in being the, the among the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for which we are told that other prophets prayed to be among His Ummah. And Isa Alaihi Salam will is the only prophet who will come among the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we, without any prayer, we were gifted in that position to be in that position. Infinitely fortunate. Proper thankfulness will be in following his footsteps. Our responsibility as the best of Ummah is in calling others towards the good and forbidding evil. Making his prime concern, which is how people can be saved from the fire of Jahannam and enter heaven, uh, Jannah. Uh, in making his prime concern, our prime concern, in being messenger of the messen messengers of the messenger is, is our immortality. And I have so many people seek immortality. Immortality is in, is in Jannah, is in Jannah not in Jahannam. In, in Jahannam also people will live forever, but that's not a place to be in, to be living forever. More books have been written about him or about his sayings and rulings than about anyone else. However much we say about him, a lot will remain unsaid. How, however many Talim Halkas you spend in his seerah, so much will remain unsaid. He has been extolled by all believers and vilified by few unbelievers. However much one may vilify him, his luminosity, his luster is unaffected. The only way of living acceptable to Allah Ta'ala is the way of living exemplified by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is that way of life, Muhammadu Rasulullah, after la ilaha illallah. Now, how do we obey Allah? Muhammad Rasulullah. So following his footsteps, confer success and peace in this life and in the eternal life. Nothing else will confer success and peace. Do we want to follow his footsteps and gain peace and success and immortality or do we want to remain indifferent to him and face utter failure and damnation the choice is ours. Alhamdulillah, I thought I will take more time. So this part at least is over. And after this, uh, I, can, I can take a uh, little less time every day. Okay. Um, so we come to the aspect of dua. Uh, two of our brothers in the last week lost their mothers. One is Said Hassan Jenny from 20th batch, lost his mother uh, who contracted uh, coronavirus and, and then she uh, was affected by other uh, maladies that she had and uh, was in life support for a number of days. And finally, she left this mortal world. May Allah Ta'ala grant her the status of Shaheed. And uh, brother, Dr. Hassan Tariq Nipu from 18 batch, professor in Rajshahi Medical College, lost his mother. And uh, his mother is Kala of Sarwar Raju of 18 batch, who's our regular participant in our Talim Halka. So she had diabetes and other complications. May Allah Ta'ala grant her Jannatul Ferdos. From Nipu, to me, you can speak to Alaikum. I am Dr. Mawad Hasan Tariq Nipu. I am a medical doctor. I am a doctor who is a doctor. Diabetes only put chillen, 
बड़ो भाई छोट भाई जरा आज के दवा अंश ग्रहण कर सबा के पक्ष पक्ष चेष्टा करते छोट कर इंतकाल कर हामिद भाई दुआ आयोजन कर May Allah forgive our parents, elevate their status in their Amen. jannah, Amen. and Amen. thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. And to Jennifer and Nipu, I will just take a, a minute or two to remind them that now it is your turn to give her all the or give them. all the blessings that you can send for them through your good deeds through your obedience of allah as per the way of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and praying for them they have taken so much trouble for you and now it's your turn to pay back and you can never pay back but try your best so prayers through sadaqa to fulfilling their wishes that they could not fulfill wasiyat to maintaining kinship their relatives are your relatives so maintain those kinship that will also convey blessings for them or bring blessings for them and taking care of those who were their favorites they used to mix with people who were not their relatives take care of those people so through these five means praying for them to sadaqa especially sadaqa jariya that will uh, which is ceaseless sadaqa through uh, fulfilling their their wishes through uh, maintaining kinship and taking care of their near and dear ones you'll be conveying benefit to them and please remember that allah taala will convey their provision in the grave as you lead a righteous life and pray for them so Uh, right then and there as you pray for them uh, goodness and blessings will be conveyed their provision in the grave will be will be conveyed through the angel of allah to them with your name mentioned as i heard from a mufti with your name mentioned and they will pray for you and we will pray for all those who passed away our near and dear ones our friends or anybody who was associated with uh, rcc our relatives and we will pray for all 
of us who are living, our near and dear ones who are living, our relatives. And uh, uh, I will, I, 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 I uh, read a scholar's writing that when you pray for the dead, uh, recite Surah Fatiha once and Surah Ikhlas three times, and then you pray. So I request everyone to uh, recite Surah Fatiha and Surah Ikhlas three times. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawmiddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina sirat al-mustakim. Sirat al-ladhina na'amta alayhim. Ghayri al-maktubi alayhim. Walatawalim. Ameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid. Walam yulad. Walam yakullahu kufuan ahad. Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim Kul Hu Allahu Ahad Allahu Samad Lam Yalid Walam Yulad Walam Yakullahu Kufuan Ahad Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim Kul Hu Allahu Ahad Allahu Samad Lam Yalid Walam Yulad Walam Yakullahu Kufuan Ahad This is from Sarwar, yeah, so we have already mentioned that. There is no other request other than uh, uh, the the one that I mentioned, Sarwar's Kala and uh, Nipu's mother. Allahumma amin, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, jazallahu anna Muhammad and sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ahu wa ahduhu. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa anta alayka tawakkaltu wa anta rabbu larshil kareem, mashallahu ka'ana wa ma'alum ya sha'alum ya kum wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi la li lazim alamu anna allaha ala kulli shayin kadir wa anna allaha tadahatu bi kulli shayin ilma allahum min yawzu bika min sharrin nafsi wa min sharri kulli tabatin anta akhizun bin asiyatiha inna rabbi ala sirati mustaqim Subhana Rabbi al-Ali al-Ala al-Wahhab, Subhana Allahi wa bihamdihi adada khalqi wa riza nafsi wa zina ta'arshi wa mizada kalimati. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatu wa fi al-akhirati hasanatu wa kina azab al-nar wa kina azab al-kabar wa kina azab al-mizan wa kina azab al-pulsirat wa kina azab al-masih al-tajjal. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zuriyatina kurata ayyuni wa jalna lil muttaqina imama rabbi jalni mukima salati wa min zuriyati rabbana taqabal dua. Wallah, O Parvardigar, Ya Rahmur Rahimeen, Anta wali fi dunya wal akhira ya fatir samawati wal ard. Wallah, tumi amadir ke jaki chu amul parar. توفیق دیا سو بیکتی کا توفیق بے بنگ شمشتی کا توفیق بے جا کی چھو بالا روشنا توفیق دیا سو اللہ تار بھول بھرانتی شمشت ہن کرے تمہا شاہید اور بارے قبول کرو اللہ اگو کار سواب رسول کریم صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کا سب پوچھے دیو اللہ اگو جا کی چھو ہمرا پاٹ کرے سی اللہ اگو بولے سی اگو شنے سی اللہ شمشت کی چھو سواب اللہ تمہی اما دیر دوی چاچی جا رہا تمہار حوالائی پوچھے سین اللہ تمہی تادر کاسے پہنچے دیو اللہ ایبنگ آمد در کونو آتیو شو جن تو دی تمہار کاسے پہنچے گیا تھا کہ ارمود دے اللہ تمہیں تادر کاسے پہنچے دیو اللہ واللہ ایبنگ تادر قبر راجاب ایبنگ آمد در پیتا ماتا ایبنگ دادا دادی ایبنگ نانا نانی چاچا چاچی پوپا پوپو خالا خالو ماما مامی آتیو شو جن بانتو بانتو شکھو شکھو دی پارا پوٹی بیشی بسا شمس تو مسلمان آمد در کال واللہ تمہیں پروردگار اللہ یا رحم الرحمین یا رحم المسکین یا زل قوت المتین یا قاضی الحاجات یا رفی الدرجات یا حلال المشکلات اللہ تمہیں تدر قبر راجب معاف کرے دیو اللہ واللہ تمہیں تدر قبر کے پروشست کرے دیو اللہ اللہ تمہیں تدر قبر کے نور دے پوری پونڈ کرے دیو اللہ تمہیں تدر قبر کے جنت الفرد و سر پاگان پانیے دیو اللہ اللہ تمہیں تدر درجہ پردیتا دین اوچو کرتے تھا کو اللہ اللہ تمہیں تادر دور جائے اوچھو کرو کیا مت دین اللہ عرش نیچے چھایا دیو اللہ ام اللہ مردان ہاتے دیو اب ہم نشید تو مونے رکھو جو دین شبائی شبائی شئی بھائیں کر دینے اتان تو چنتا تھاک بے اللہ بیتی بیستی تھاک بے اللہ تمہیں تادر کے نشید تو مونے رکھو اب ہم بھی دو تیر گوتی تے پول سیرات پار ہر توفیق دیو اب ہم کنا ہی شابے جانا تو پھر دو سے داخل کرو اللہ اللہ یا رحم الرحمین آمدر جیبان تو ہمرا گناہ کٹیے دلام اللہ ایبان 
অনেক সময় কোন না করলেও আমরা হেলাই হারালাম আল্লাহ জীবনটাকে আল্লাহ আমরা কবরের প্রান্তে এসে পৌঁছেছি আল্লাহ কবরের কবরের পাশেই দাঁড়িয়ে আল্লাহ এক পা দুনিয়াতে আর এক পা যেন কবরে আল্লাহ তুমি আমাদের সমস্ত গোনা খাতা মাফ করে দাও আল্লাহ আমাদের কোথায় যে সময় আমরা হেলাই হারিয়েছি না নেকি করে না গোনা করে আল্লাহ সেই সময়টাকে তুমি মাফ করে দাও আল্লাহ তার বদলেও তুমি নেকি লিখে দিও আল্লাহ তোমার পরম করুণায় তোমার পরম দয়ায় আল্লাহ এবং আমাদের জীবন এখন থেকে পাল্টিয়ে দাও আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ আমাদেরকে তোমার এমন ইমান দান করো আল্লাহ এমন এবং এমন আমল দান করো আল্লাহ যাতে করে তোমার তোমার হুকুম আমরা তামিল করতে পারি তোমার তোমার বান্দার প্রতি হুকুম আমরা দায়িত্ব আমরা আমরা পুরাপুরি ভাবে আমরা পালন করতে পারি আল্লাহ এবং কারো প্রতি দায়িত্ব কাউকে আঘাত দিয়েছি কারো প্রতি দায়িত্ব পালন করি নেই আল্লাহ তুমি তোমার অশেষ মেহরবাণীতে তাদেরকে খুশি করে দিও যাতে তারা আমাদের মাফ করে দেয় আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ এবং তোমার বাণী পৌঁছে দেওয়া তৌফিক দান করো আল্লাহ এবং প্রত্যেকটা কাজ তোমার সন্তুষ্টির সাথে করার তৌফিক দান করো আল্লাহ তোমার ভালোবাসার সাথে করার তৌফিক দান করো আল্লাহ আমাদের হাবিবের ভালোবাসা আমাদের অন্তরে দিও আল্লাহ এবং আমাদেরকে হুসনে হুসনুল খলুক হুসনে আখলাক সুন্দর আচার আচরণ চরিত্র দান করো আল্লাহ রসুল্লাহ সাল্লা সাল্লামের সুন্দর আচার আচরণের ছিটা ফোটা আমাদের দান করো আল্লাহ এবং আমাদেরকে নফসের থেকে নফসের তারণা থেকে এবং শয়তানের ধোকার থেকে এবং দুনিয়ার আকর্ষণের থেকে প্রতিটা মুহূর্তে তুমি বাঁচিয়ে রেখো আল্লাহ এক মুহূর্তের জন্য ছেড়ে দিও না আল্লাহ এবং হাত ধরে আমাদের কবর পর্যন্ত নিয়ে যেও এবং যখন তুমি সন্তুষ্ট থাকো আমাদের উপরে তখন পৃথিবী থেকে নিয়ে যেও কলেমা সহ আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ কলেমা সহ তোমার সন্তুষ্টি সহ আল্লাহ যাতে তোমার সর্বোত্তম ব্যবহার আমরা পেতে পারি কবরে এবং হাসারের ময়দানে এবং কুৎসিরাত পার হতে এবং বিনা হিসেবে জন্য তোর ফের দোষে দাখিল হতে আল্লাহ আমরা বিভিন্ন নেক হাজতে হাত উঠিয়ে হাজত নিয়ে হাত উঠিয়েছি আল্লাহ বিভিন্ন বিপদ আপদের কারণে হাত উঠিয়েছি বিভিন্ন অসুখ বিসুখের কারণে হাত উঠিয়েছি তা আমাদের হোক বা আমাদের সন্তান সন্ততির হোক আমাদের আত্মীয় স্বজনের হোক আমাদের পাড়া প্রতিবেশীর হোক আমাদের দেশবাসীর হোক আমাদের আমাদের বিশ্ববাসীর হোক আল্লাহ তুমি নিমিষের মধ্যে সমস্ত কিছু দূর করে দিতে পারো আল্লাহ তুমি আমাদেরকে হেফাজত করো হেদায়ত করো রহমত করো বা ফেরাত করো আল্লাহ সমস্ত মুসলমানকে ক্ষমা করো আল্লাহ সমস্ত মানুষকে হেদায়ত দান করো আল্লাহ যাদের কেউ দোয়া করার নাই তাদের জন্য আমরা দোয়া করছি আল্লাহ কত অন্নহারা বস্ত্রহারা গৃহহারা দিশাহারা পথহারা কন্যাদায়গ্রস্ত রোগগ্রস্ত ঋণগ্রস্ত অভাবগ্রস্ত আল্লাহ তুমি একমাত্র তাদের দেখভাল করার মালিক আল্লাহ একমাত্র তাদের বিপদ দূর করার মালিক আল্লাহ একমাত্র তাদের জুলুম দূর করার মালিক আল্লাহ ও আল্লাহ আমাদের এক ভাই বিপদের মধ্যে আছে কষ্টের মধ্যে আছে তুমি তাকে হেফাজত করো আল্লাহ রক্ষা করো আল্লাহ আমাদের যেসব ভাইরা এবং আমাদের জানাশোনার মধ্যে যারাই অসুখ অসুখ বিষয়ের মধ্যে বিপদ আপদের মধ্যে আছে আল্লাহ তোমার কাছে হাত হাত উঠাই হাত উঠিয়েছি আল্লাহ তুমি খালি হাতে আমাদের ফিরিয়ে দিও না আল্লাহ তুমি তাদের বিপদ আপদ অসুখ বিসুখ দূর করে দিও আল্লাহ তোমার সান মতো যাইতে পারি নাই তোমার সান মতো দান করো আল্লাহ তোমার সান মতো হেফাজত চাইতে পারি নাই তোমার সান মতো হেফাজত করো আল্লাহ আল্লাহ কবুল করেন ওকে তাহলে আমি সবাইকে অনুরোধ করব তৌহিদ ইমাম নববীর চল্লিশ হাদিসে কুৎসির বই থেকে 
কটি হাদিস অফ ইমাম নববি আজকে মনে হয় আট নম্বর শেষ করবা নাকি তৌহিদ আট নম্বর শেষ করেছি গত সপ্তাহে আলহামদুলিল্লাহ আমরা একটু আলোচনা করব যদি কেউ কিছু অ্যাড করতে চায় আট নম্বরে উই উইল অ্যাকসেপ্ট দ্যাট দেন উই স্টার্ট লাইন ইনশাআল্লাহ টুডে আসসালামু আলাইকুম বিসমিল্লাহির রহমানির রহিম আলহামদুলিল্লাহ রাব্বিল আলামিন আসসালাতু ওয়াসসালামু আলা রাসূলুল্লাহ সাল্লাল্লাহু আলাইহি ওয়াসাল্লাম আজমাইন আল্লাহুম্মা ইন্নী আসলুকা ইলমান নাফিয়া রাব্বি সিদনি ইলমা রাব্বি ইয়াসির ওয়ালা তুয়াসির ওয়া তামমিন বিল খাইর লাস্ট উইক উই ডিসকাস হাদিস নাম্বার 8 ফ্রম ইমাম নাবিরি 40 হাদিস এন্ড দ্যাট হাদিস ওয়াজ হোল এলাবোরেট অন জিহাদ উই ট্রাই টু ডিসকাস উইদিন आवर শর্ট স্কোপ হোয়াট ইজ জিহাদ লেভেল অফ জিহাদ এন্ড and and other related thing so some of the brothers they are they are interested to learn more so actually i'll not go into more detail of it but if any of us has learned anything about jihad today he can add to our knowledge he can contribute from his behalf if anything anybody want to add you have a chance to add now If there is no comment, then we go to the next hadith. We go to the next hadith. But before that, we may just recall that our, uh, our we, say, we mentioned that our jihad has four levels. Our jihad has four levels. We have to fulfill level one, then level two, and level three, and level four. Otherwise, jihad will be uh not complete or jihad will be not comprehensive or it will not provide uh, a desired result so jihad uh, level one and level two is internal jihad mostly internal jihad level one covers uh, knowledge amal dawa and sabar on internal jihad level two is jihad against iblis also internal jihad and level three jihad against jahi a jahid so we mentioned one hadith which will be covered later on that when there is a evil we see any evil we will try to rectify it with our hands if not then with our words and if not then with our hearts heart so this is an external jihad this is an external jihad and this is only applicable uh, within your capacity within your capacity and uh, level level 4 fourth level of jihad is against the kafir against the non believer against the non believer and we mentioned that the certain condition have to fulfill this type of jihad has to be uh, a- a- accompanied with a under under the leadership under certain leadership either religious leader or administrative leader so this must be done in a leadership through proper procedure through uh countries or religious sharia follow sharia, follow the sharia and country law to proceed with that this type of hadith uh, so uh, participation in jihad is fard to ain for everybody fard to ain but must fulfill required condition that is one of the most important thing Okay, so we end Hadith 8 here and we move to Hadith 9. Hadith 9 is Hadith 9 is talking about uh, etiquette of question. Etiquette of question. This is also an important thing. Uh, the hadith has been narrated by uh, Abdul Rahman, Abu Huraira Abdul Rahman Ibn Sakhar. We already described him in our earlier hadith, Abu Huraira Abdul Rahman bin Sakhar. So Abu Huraira is the Kunia. So Abu Huraira means he is the father of Huraira. 
And Abdul Rahman is actually named Bin Sakhar, his lineage, his father, his family. So Abu Huraira actually unmarried. He was unmarried. But how come he was named Abu Huraira, father of Abu Huraira? So there is a story that he used to uh, take care of a lot of kittens. So Huraira means kitten. So he was named Abu Huraira, father of kitten. That is how he, he earned the name of Abu Huraira. So full name, we say Abu Huraira Abdul Rahman bin Sakhar. He uh, came to Medina uh, just four years before the offer of Rasulullah Sallam. And he was very much dedicated for the knowledge. And, and he was one of the one of the uh, uh, narrator of the hadith. Uh, they, he narrated a lot of hadith. Uh, how many? I don't remember how many exactly. But they, he narrated the highest number of hadith. 5,374. Yeah, something like that. I think that, yeah. Whereas, uh, whereas uh, Aisha Rajallahu and Huma only narrated 1,000 plus, 1,000 plus. Okay, so he is a he was unmarried. He lived in the uh, Masjid Nawabi uh, itself. So there's a group of people. There's a group of people who abandon their family and uh, stay in the Masjid Nawabi uh, to pursue knowledge. And this group is called Ahle Sufa. So he is a leader of Ahle Sufa. Abu Abu Huraida. Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhar was the leader of Abu uh, uh, leader of Ahle Sufa. So these are the main uh, uh, characteristics or main uh, main uh, attributes that we can attribute to, uh, to this narrator. Okay, let's let's read the hadith now. This hadith said i read in english first because i think for our understanding english is better abu huraja abdul rahman ibn sakar radiallahu anhu reported i heard the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam say avoid that which i forbid you to do and do that which i commanded i command you to do to the best of your capacity Verily, the people before you are destroyed, destroyed only because of their excessive questioning and their disagreement with the Prophet. So this is the actually two so two sentences. This are this. So first thing is a uh, Rasulullah Sallam asks forbid. If Rasulullah forbids something, please don't do. And if he ordered something to do. Please do to the best of our capacity. And he said that the earlier people who were destroyed, they were destroyed because of excessive question and disagreement with their prophet. Okay, this hadith has an incident attached to it. There are some hadith, like hadith number one, uh, hadith niyat, also attached. There's an attached incident. We call it, we call it uh, shabab and Urud, Shabab and Urud. This type of hadith are characteristic by a special name They're called Hadith, Hadith Mursal Sal. Hadith Mursal Sal means Hadith itself got an incident attached to it. So we can, if we recall that uh, Hadith Niyat, we have an incident that one of the one of the Sahabi he traveled to Medina to get married with a woman, and then this Hadith of Niyat came out after this uh, after this instead, uh, incident so this is attached to the hadith number one and this uh, hadith number nine is also an incident what is the incident the incident once prophet was addressing muslim regarding hajj regarding hajj then the prophet said allah has commanded you to perform hajj so perform it so at that point one of the men stood up and asked the question 
Is it every year or Prophet of Allah? So Prophet remained, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remained quiet and this gentleman asked the same question thrice, three times. Um, Prophet seemed to be a little unhappy regarding the question and then he answered. He said that, were I to say yes, it would be obligatory and you would not be able to do it. Leave me with what I have left you. For indeed, the one who were before you were destroyed, destroyed because of excessive question and their variance with their prophet, with their prophets. Then, if I command to do something, then do it as much as you are able to. And when I forbid you to do something, leave it. So this was the incident. From this incident, this hadith came out. All right. So there's a the first thing we learn from this hadith is a etiquette of questioning. Etiquette of questioning. So if we remember that and hadith number two, hadith Jibril, also talked about etiquette of questioning. In that hadith, uh, Jibril alayhi salam came to uh, came to Rasulullah Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and asked him a few questions. And through a question, he tried to teach Muslim about the deen. So, So that question was uh, beneficial, useful, and and that question is a uh, something like uh, it provides uh, advancement in the knowledge. And the question in this hadith mentioned is a uh, bit confusing, going through excess detail that Prophet Sallallahu didn't want to mention. If your leader want to keep something obscure, do not force him to uh, to go into detail of it because he has a purpose. He know what you want to do. He has a purpose. So this type of question, that question that uh, creates confusion among the people, then it is not advisable to ask question. So. When we ask question, we must use our wisdom. If you have a, if you have a uh, question, if you are worried by the question or something, please ask it privately, not in public. This type of question should be asked privately, not by, uh, not in public. So this is the first uh, knowledge we get from the hadith: etiquette of questioning. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So some question to be asked by faith. Some question if we can ask in public. Okay, then we go to the next part of the hadith. Next part of the hadith that hadith say that hadith say that which is forbidden, avoid it. Which is forbidden, avoid it. So so this is a principle, this is a principle in our Islam, that when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says something forbidden, avoid it completely, avoid it completely, because prohibition is easier to do, because when you are asked to, not to do something, means you do not have to do anything, you do not have to put any effort to do anything, but you, if you are asked to do something, you have to put effort to perform the action. So prohibition is always easy. So please, that's why complete prohibition is more easy, more easy. So this uh, this principle that uh, principle, uh, uh, prohibition should be prohibited totally means you make our life. It makes our life easy actually. It makes our life easy. Uh, if prohibition we do halfway. That makes the thing more difficult than the if we com we completely uh, uh, we completely uh, stop 
doing any avoid doing any uh, prohibition so this is the principle that prohibition is not a burden prohibition is not a burden but prohibition makes the life easy and and when we are asked to do something when you are asked to do something then we have to look into it uh, whether uh, whether there's a condition or not there's a condition or not like uh, like let's say uh, Doing the obligation to the best of one's ability. This is uh, in Surah Surah Hajj. Surah Hajj. It is mentioned that uh, uh, Surah Hajj is mentioned that Wama ja ala alaikum min haran. So our religion doesn't bring any extra burden on anybody. So uh, yeah. Okay, so doing doing the uh, following the Sharia law, any commandment to fulfill any commandment, there's a flexibility. Sharia is flexible. Sharia is flexible in many way, many way. That when we say that, let, let's say, let's say there's a hadith that talking about salah. That hadith is mentioned by Imran bin Hussein. The hadith mentioned, pray standing if you can. If you cannot, then sitting. If you cannot, then lying on your side. So from this hadith, we see that uh, uh, to do something, you don't want to, uh, the Asharia doesn't want to bring a difficulty or hardship on us. We make our life easier by, by uh, let's say, uh, theory of obligation, uh, yeah, theory of compulsion, compulsion. Theory of compulsion means when we are, we cannot do, we cannot follow certain thing, and we become uh, we are forced to do certain thing. If we are forced to do certain thing, it is allowed in Sharia, even though it breaks the law, it breaks the uh, it breaks or it it makes some compromise. It makes some compromise. So let's talk talk about one example here: obligation versus prohibition. Obligation. Versus prohibition, scholars use the example of Iblis and Adab. Iblis was asked to uh, prostrate in front of Adam alayhi salam. So he was commanded to do something. And Adam alayhi salam was asked not to go to the certain tree. So this is a prohibition. Iblis was commanded to do something. And Adam was, Adam alayhi salam was uh, given a prohibition not to do something. And, and uh, Adam alayhi salam, when he, when he failed, he was excused. But obligation, when the Iblis failed, he was not excused. So, uh, from this hadith, from this example, scholars sometimes they, they mention that prohibition is easier. And obligation is more difficult. But there are also scholars who put equal emphasis or equal importance on both. They put equal importance on both obligation and prohibition. Surah Hasad, Allah asked, What Prophet give you taking? And what Prophet uh, Prophet Sallam took away, do not take it. Do not take it. So these all these things are the uh, are the supplementary ayah for this uh, for the in support of this hadith. So the next principle is Allah prefers ease for you. Allah prefers ease for you. So how it is done? Uh, one should not add or impose additional hardship in ibadah this is one thing we must remember when you do ibadah means it doesn't mean that if we do uh how to say if we do uh, uh extra effort to do ibadah means more reward no there's no such thing this is against the principle principle of uh islam 
that anybody, everybody has his own capacity to do ibadah and it is all right to do ibadah according to his capacity, according to his capacity. Even, even it is uh, acceptable to do some, uh, uh, do some, uh, let's say some compromise when he is forced by necessity, but the condition is he is not desiring it or he is not transgressing. He is not desiring or he is not transgressing, but he is forced by necessity. He, there, uh, there could be compromise in uh, following the commandment. Okay. Then the other thing is uh, one always choose that what is easier. If option are available, if there's two or three option is available, we must choose what is easier. This is one of the principle. All right. And third principle is if there is a, no other alternative for obligation, then hardship incurred in fulfillment will earn extra reward. So there is a condition that hardship will earn extra reward, but uh, but this is when it is a when it is an obligation like it is raining it is raining and you have no other choice you have to go to the mosque under the rain so this in this case we will we will earn extra reward for the ibadah but we take a longer route to go to mosque we will not earn any extra reward for the uh, for going to the mosque that is the principle okay so From this hadith, actually this hadith is quite short, so from this hadith we find three principles. One principle is etiquette for question, another principle is uh, the uh, rule for prohibition, rule for prohibition and the logic and the logic behind prohibition, why you should follow prohibition, prohibition is easier to follow. And third principle that we get that here that uh, that our ibadah should be done according to our individual capacity individual capacity and uh, allah prefers ease in our uh, command in his commandments so don't take uh, anything that is difficult like like reciting a very long surah is good but some people are not able to do it for them it's okay they can uh, recite a very short surah in salah and that is all right so more or less this is the basic principle that we derive from this hadith number uh, nine and we call it a hadith for uh, hadith for uh, etiquette of question etiquette of prohibition so that is actually today my end of my talk I will open the floor for questioning. If anybody wants to ask any question, you can go ahead. Alhamdulillah. Subhanaka wa bihamdik. Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilahi.